Welcome back to Highly Respected. I'm your host, Scott Greer. Today we've got a very good episode, an incredible episode. And you, I know every time you guys are not going to believe this when I tell you it's going to be an incredible episode. Then boom, it is an incredible episode. And you're like, whoa, I can't believe he did this again. And yes, it is true. It's going to be an incredible episode. We're going to have a topic. I know you guys are probably not going to guess what it is about, but... I'm going to have to reveal it right now. It's going to be all about Ukraine. I, I know you guys were not expecting that, but that's what the topic is going to be about today. Uh, it's uh, hard to, dis, uh, to decide where to start with the Ukraine conflict. I guess I can start with the basics. In case you've uh, been living under a rock for the past week, Russia invaded Ukraine late Wednesday night last week. Um, you know, they've so far, even though the media is portraying it as they're just constantly getting their ass kicked, they have suffered thousands of casualties while Ukrainian soldiers have only suffered like a hundred. Uh, pretty much the only people they're killing are thousands of civilians. And, um, this is what we're getting from the media and they keep getting tanks blown up and, uh, planes shot down and all this stuff that we're getting fed. I mean, we really don't know what the hell's happening. All we know is that. Uh, at least three major cities in, in Ukraine are currently surrounded, including the capital, or it's likely surrounded, even though the mayor said, the mayor said yesterday in an interview with Western Media, uh, this capital surrounded, we can't evacuate. And then he's like, this was Russian disinformation, um, which, you know, was his own words being said. So we're, I mean, it appears that they do have the capital surrounded to some extent, maybe not completely surrounded, uh, but, you know, they're encircling it are in the process of that and to other cities as well. So this is what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, but the world response has been a uh, incredibly negative, <laughs> to put it lightly. The EU and uh, other international backers have placed sanctions on, U on Russia, rather. Uh, very intense sanctions. They're kicking them off the SWIFT uh, payment uh, system. Uh, which is doing a number on their banks and their financial uh, system that they have in, in Russia. They are, yeah, and there's personal sanctions placed on Putin and Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, and on and on and so forth. So they have very uh, tough sanctions, and the whole world is united behind Ukraine. And even nations that were had friendlier relations with Russia, such as Hungary, are now clamoring for you know full-on support for Ukraine and full support for sanctions on Putin and Russia. I'm not going to go too much into like the latest breaking developments for this because it changes uh, every hour. So what you may be listening to this uh, may be a completely different situation by the time you listen to this. So I don't want to necessarily focus on up to date things because it, it could be out of date by, you know, an hour away from now. So really what I want to focus on is a couple things of, about this conflict and takes that we should take or should take from it and <laughs> we'll use take twice in one sentence uh the first thing i want to go over is you know i i do have to admit that late last year when we were talking about this conflict with nemitz and even when i went on with russians with attitude podcast i think in early in january is that i was saying i don't see putin invading uh, ukraine and i had the reasons for that is that one, he didn't want to take over the, you know, Russian government didn't want to take on the services in Donbass or those separate governments of Luhansk and Donetsk. He didn't want to necessarily take over those. You know, they have their own problems. And, you know, he really wants to, he really was getting these soldiers around to surround Ukraine in order to wring concessions from them. But then the situation changed, and for I think ever since early February, against the start of February, some people may fact check me on this, but I do remember at least two weeks beforehand, I was saying that the war with them is more likely. Um, is that the the total facts on the ground change? One, they were not giving any concessions to Russia, and the West was saying we're not going to give you anything. Uh, but here you can have some arms control uh, settlement and that's it. And that's what you guys can be fine with that. Clearly, that's not what Russia wanted. Russia is very insistent saying we want more than this. Uh, we're not going to be satisfied with what you're giving us. Th this is the fact that this is the fact of the story. Why aren't you giving us what us what we want? And I was seeing this at this time is that Putin is doing this massive military buildup. And he had, you know, two options. He can back down and look weak to the entire world. 
and also encourage Ukraine to go more into NATO and he got nothing out of this massive military buildup, or he could take a gamble and invade. And uh, for the past, at least for the past two, or the two, two weeks leading up to the invasion, I was saying there's a greater likelihood that Putin will invade. And he did because of that uh, strategic calculation, unless there was some concession wrung from Ukraine. And no concession was wrung from Ukraine, and now he's there. Uh, you know, it is turning out to be a lot riskier uh, than expected. I don't know necessarily if I was saying that Ukraine would be completely crushed in a, you know, a day. <laughs> uh, but it is like a nature of news now is that there's so many breaking news updates and people are so impatient that they feel that Ukraine just surviving for a few days means that Russia is getting its ass kicked. And due to the massive amount of propaganda that we're facing with, you know, the ghost of Kiev, or I'm going to say it's it's Kiev, ghost of Kiev, and the Snake Island hoax, and all these things, and then just claiming that like a random civilian put, picked up a picked up an RPG and destroyed an entire Russian tank convoy, and they're like, this is totally believable, and this is what they're all roaning with in the Western media. You know, you think that Ukraine is just killing uh, Russians left and right and they're not scoring any casualties and the citizen super soldiers with zero military training are killing 20 Russian soldiers apiece. I mean, if, even if you look at the figures right now, you know, it's like Ukraine is inflicting 30 to 1 casualties according to their own official s statistics on this. And that's just completely unbelievable on the fact of it. And Russia does have like proof of them destroying tanks. I want to say is that we don't have an accurate picture either from Russian or Ukraine media. We don't, they always keep complaining about Russian disinformation. There was a lot of Russian disinformation being spread over the internet on rumors uh, on the night of the invasion. But ever since then, we have gotten like no disinformation, like no information whatsoever from Russia. I mean, we don't have no earthly idea. We just know their positions and movements that's it we don't really know their casualty figures we don't know how many we really don't know how many ukrainians they're killing wounding or capturing uh all this is left in the air and any time that you know ukrainian soldiers are captured in their uniforms they claim that these are russian saboteurs being captured by by ukrainians i mean the russian saboteur thing is such a broad thing that they've just been using uh any time that there's a war crime being committed by ukrainians they claim that they're russian saboteurs and ukrainian outfits or ukrainian armor uh there was this clip of a ukrainian uh, vehicle crashing into a car and they claim that was Russian saboteurs who had taken the car. And anyway, they're like, this is a horrible war crime. And it's like, a car accident is the worst war crime you can find. It's like, why are they committing war crimes to just like a random car accident? Wouldn't they try to do something else? And, but, <laughs> you know, that's what they're trying to claim. And so we're just facing all this. But it is having an effect on the propaganda effort. As like I've tweeted is that Ukraine is receiving all this tremendous Western level support and they're telling their population we're kicking Russia's ass. And this means they don't want to make any type of peace deal that Russia agreed to. On the ground, militarily, Russia is you know winning so far. But in terms of diplomatically and in the information war, they're losing. And when it comes to uh, Western, you know, Western elites view of the war, you know, the fact that they're seeing, you know, ghost of Kiev and, uh, you know, citizen super soldiers killing 20 so Russian soldiers on their own. You know, they're thinking like, oh, Russia's Ukraine shouldn't surrender. They're kicking Russia's ass. So they're going to encourage them to not make any negotiation deal. Because really what the global American empire wants is for Ukraine to make this as long and a project protracted struggle as possible. They want an insurgency. They do not want a peace deal. They do not want a permanent peace. They want to weaken Russia because they have this calculation that, you know, with the sanctions and the war being drawn out, that they can finally regime change Moscow. And that's the ultimate goal, much more so than supporting Ukraine. They want regime change in Moscow. This is what they've been wanting for many, many years. And they feel that they finally have the opportunity to do this. And that's why Washington was so eager for this war effort is because they thought that they can isolate Russia from Europe, which they're doing. 
they thought that the whole world could get behind Ukraine and no matter how many losses Ukraine could take, that they'll have this long protracted struggle because, you know, they're winning the propaganda war. And of course, they're winning the propaganda war. And this would give them the opportunity to pass devastating sanctions, isolate Russia and, you know, have the ability to get these large protests out in the street to, you know, move uh, Putin out of the way. And they're also going to try to do this in Belarus again as well as with Belarus joining the struggle. So that's why they're so eager for that. Um, so I guess that goes all back to the predictions. I don't think, you know, the one thing to be clear is that Ukraine is a pretty large country. And when we're looking at these other wars from many years, you know, it took, it, you know, countries aren't conquered in a day, <laughs> especially when they have like a military that is trained by, <laughs> the West, and they're given the best weaponry, some of the best weaponry we have. And they're receiving a ton of support and funding from the West and many other factors. I mean, they're not going to be just conquered in a day. I think maybe some people, if I even ever said that, I, I was wrong in it, implying that they would be conquered in like a day or two. Um, but yeah, that's that's the fact of the matter. I mean, wars aren't won in a in a day they usually take much longer unless there's completely lopsided as we saw in iraq i mean even compared with iraq you know it took us three weeks to conquer iraq one american military was doing shock and all which russia military is not doing shock and all uh, largely i think this is a political strategy i think russia may be overestimated or underestimated the rather underestimated ukraine's military capacity i would have said overestimated their ability to force ukraine to quick surrender and underestimated ukrainian military to resist i think that's a fact and they wanted to avoid civilian casualties and mass casualties on their own side for political reasons is that if they're avoiding civilian casualties they can risk uh not risk as great of a condemnation from the rest of the world and if they're risking their uh are trying to have as few few casualties as possible on their side they're trying to minimize political blowback and domestically in russia and that's why they carry this out if they're doing a shock and all campaign you know they're you know mass bombing of these cities and other things uh, you know that's not going to look politically well but i mean right now regardless of this they're already having this effect of the worldwide condemnation of their actions and mass sanctions against them so maybe they should have just go on with a quick strike or if they wanted to win the war maybe a quick strike would have been better in their interest who knows but that's the calculation that they likely took there with having a more limited strike and so even with compared with america's effort also the iraqi army was uh greatly inferior to the ukrainian army and there's a much greater sense of parity between the Ukrainian army and the Russian army. The Russian army is clearly superior, but you know the Iraqi army compared to the coalition of the willing and Operation Iraqi Freedom, uh, you know, <laughs> it was much great. It was much more lopsided. Now, whether the war, you know, war predictions, probably not the podcast for this because it's really up in the air. Everything is in flux, and it depends on you know a lot of it's now depending on political will of putin rather than what's happening on the ground because i mean the ground if you look you know conventional military uh strategy i mean it's not looking well for the ukrainians but you know, a lot of this warfare is taking place on the diplomatic stage and in the information war and ukraine or russia is not doing well in that regard so i want to move on to the different points we'll talk more about the information war in the second point i want to address but the first point i want to say is People are always wanting, like, what side should we take? Where should we look? Who should we stand with in this? And uh, people always, like, say this. I don't want to necessarily say that it's greatly important who we stand with because ultimately we're just it's all our, our own voices on Twitter or social media and on the Internet saying what we're doing. I don't advocate for staging a protest for either side. But it, you're having to say is, like, which side you should you stand with? And then... I think it's more about not who you're standing with or supporting, but who you're not supporting. Uh, I actually think neutrality is probably the best option for us because generally speaking, you know, this is not our problem. This is, this is the, you know, America's interests are not involved or should not be involved here. I want to say should not be, but unfortunately they are. And really what this battle is, is that Ukraine is a gay client state, it is a globalist American 
American Empire client state. That's a GAE, gay for short, uh, or gay as the acronym says. Every aspect of the globalist American empire is on its side. They say this is important. They're psyoping the whole population into getting behind Ukraine support. They're bringing out all the options in order to ensure this mass support for Ukraine. And you have to ask yourself, well, why is this so important? Uh, why would they be doing this for Ukraine? Because it is very much important for the, for the globalist American empire's power that Ukraine stands athwart Russia and stays out of the Russian sphere and is used as this cudgel against Russia. They, that is important to us. So Ukraine's victory is not so much a victory for national self-determination or the Ukrainian people. It's more of a victory for the globalist system that we oppose. And you should remember that. Now, that's not saying that Ukrainian soldiers are fighting for uh, the global American empire, that's not their motivations. Like people aren't signing up as like, I'm signing up for mass migration and gay pride marches and Harkov. You know, that's not what they're signing up for. Or they'd say Kharkiv, uh, not Harkov. <laughs> that's, that's a Russian way of saying the city. But we're going to use the Russian names because generally I'm tired of having to call it Kiev when we had been for years been calling it Kiev. And now they just suddenly told us that we have to start pronouncing it as Kiev. Um, so it's the same with all these other cities, but regardless, nobody's like signing up for that. They're not just sitting there. It's like, I can't wait to be a part of the gay and a global system, but they are saying like, we can't wait to be part of the EU. We can't wait to be a part of the NATO. And you're like, Hmm, I wonder what EU and NATO are a part of. Are they a part of the global system? Yes. And they think that this is part of that. Their lives depend on joining these internationalist groups that are able to determine their domestic politics. They want to join that, and that's a large goal of the Ukrainians. They don't necessarily associate that with gay pride marches and whatever. They associate that with protection from Russia, which they have these historic animosities between the Russians and them, and I'm not going to fault them for having these. It's the same with all these other states that border Ukraine, or border Russia, rather, that they have historic grievances against them and legitimate concerns about Russia. I understand that, but I'm also not them. I'm not a Ukrainian. I'm not a Latvian. I'm not a, I'm not a Finn, even though we have a lot of Finns on this podcast. And we're going to have a Finn on for this uh, IQ supplement later this week to get the European perspective on the the conflict and it's somebody that people have been begging for to come on many times before so he's gonna be back on to discuss this topic but regardless of that if you're coming from this as an american right winger where do i stand and some of the people have been getting uh, convinced that they have to stand with ukraine because these are nationalists fighting for their homeland and that this is about national self-determination this is an imperialist power coming in and trying to conquer them and and putin's just so evil and wrong and he's a gangster and he's running a gangster state with so much corruption and you know it overlooks the fact that like ukraine is also a gangster state with a lot of corruption and even when it goes into this uh kiev like i keep talking about these uh gun battles that keep breaking out kiev now, both sides, like I've seen both Russians and Ukrainians say, this is not actually between Ukrainian soldiers. This is between Ukrainian Kiev street gangs just like fighting, shooting at each other. I mean, they've handed out so much firepower to these citizens that they're now using these AKs and, and all these other high powered weaponry against each other. And you're like, this doesn't sound like a well ordered society at all. Uh, at all. I mean, yeah, they are in war, but you would expect that in war there'd be enough discipline to not be shooting at each other <laughs> shooting at each other on their own sides and they're like it's between rival security forces it's like what what <laughs> like within ukraine aren't you guys don't you have an enemy to fight like so th that's like another thing that's like coming through or coming through the propaganda is that we're seeing these things that don't make any sense they don't want to say Russia is anywhere near Kiev or making any strides or, or progress. So instead, they they give this thing that may be well that may be well be true, but it does show the chaotic nature of the Ukrainian side and shows that they're not this you know plucky resistance that's constantly destroying the Russians. That a lot of them are corrupt and a lot of them are using weapons against them against themselves. But they'll just blame Russian saboteurs for anything that goes wrong.
while I can understand why Ukrainians would pick up a gun and, and fight against the Russians, and I'm not one of those people who's like going to be telling them to throw down their weapons or to try to overthrow the government. It's not my place to. I mean, they're fighting in their own conflict. And if I was Ukrainian, I would have a very different view of this subject because uh, my personal situation would be changed. I would no longer be an American. I would no longer think this through the prism of my own life and my own concerns. Instead, I would be thinking this through the concerns of that of a Ukrainian. But I am not a Ukrainian, and I'm looking at the larger picture of how this impacts me and my country, and really in the global, you know, the global, uh, really just the world, rather the global whatever, the global system. And I'm seeing this through that prism, and that impacts my opinion. And I know that I don't want to stand with Ukraine because all my domestic enemies say that this is their most important struggle. And they're conflating their own concerns and their own causes with the Ukrainians. That they're seeing Ukrainians in something in the same light that they see as Black Lives Matter. They're claiming that they're a, a colonized people, that they're almost like a POC, even though there's been conflicts over saying whether they're white or not. Or rather conflicts over the concern for Ukraine being based on, upon the fact that they're white. Um, you know, there's been debates over that on social media over that matter. But that is a distraction. It's not because of white privilege or the white supremacist media that there's so much attention to Ukraine. It's because it is a prime objective of the gay to have Ukraine within its sphere. And even if you're looking at what Ukraine's doing to do this, they're saying, we're going to join the EU. And they've, I mean, Zelensky's already applied to join the EU. And they're desperately saying, you need to admit us to NATO membership now. And then they'd be fully within the global sphere. And then these people are like, this is about national self-determination. It's like, there's going to be no national self-determination when they're a full-on colony of the gay. There is going <laughs> to, and already even in their country, you know, NGOs are setting, a Western-backed NGOs are setting a lot of the policy. I've talked to many of the people, you know, they're having a lot more immigration there. They're having a lot more gay pride marches in Ukraine. They did not have BLM marches in Ukraine. It's literally one of the few places in the world without BLM marches, mainly because I don't think that they had enough. Um, the Africans there probably didn't care enough about it. And also the people, they worried that they'd upset the locals too much with BLM marches. But, you know, maybe the next time there's another George Floyd, we'd have a different situation. This and also Ukraine, unlike other countries, you know, this is not... You know, it's a far weaker country with a and far poorer than a place like Poland or even Hungary, which they're able to have a little bit more independence from the global sphere while being a part of it than Ukraine would. Ukraine would be entirely dependent on us, much more so than any Eastern European country, much more so than any Western European country. They would not have their own sovereignty. Their sovereignty would be determined by Western NGOs. The, de the, the deep state, the State Department, and the United States government. That's who would make their real decisions here. And these people were like, oh, they're fighting for their own, their own homeland and their right to self-determination, their own sovereignty. They're giving up all of that to the gay. That's what's happening here. I mean, if you're thinking that this is like going to somehow lead to a, a strong, independent Ukraine that can resist globalist forces, whether whether they're from Moscow or from Washington, D.C., that's completely ridiculous. There are Ukrainian nationalists who realize that joining with the West and the gay is a bad idea. And they have this idea of the intermarium. I guess that's how you pronounce it, where it's all of Eastern Europe comes together enjoys forces and has their own power block and that's completely unrealistic for a lot of different reasons first off all these eastern europeans have their own petty grievances against each other hungarians and romanians have problems the balkans all have problems various i mean ukrainians have problems with with poles to a certain extent uh, you know they have all these differences with each other and the most important thing is all these countries that are <laughs> are dependent on an outside power i mean particularly the united states and the eu they are so dependent on eu handouts and they beg for american defense like the one thing you have to realize is that all these like the visegrad 24 account which is supporting this type of uh you know eastern european power block it is the most like pro-American intervention in this conflict 
the most desperate for American and global support for Ukraine and the most eager for U.S. troops to be stationed in their countries permanently. That is not a sign of like striking out for independence or a sign of resistance to globalism. It's a sign that they're at when push comes to shove, they're ultimately dependent on the gay and they will beg for the gay to defend them and to give them more money. And they do not have the type of independence that, say, Russia has. Like everyone wants to condemn Russia. Like I I don't, as I said in a Telegram post, we should not become Russia files. We should not become a Putin idolist. You know, Russia has a lot of problems. Putin has a lot of his problems. I don't think, you know, and it's not like we want like all of Europe to be conquered by Putin. But compared to all these countries that we claim are base, you know, base Poland, base Hungary, Putin actually it does have independence from the gay. You know, that's something that Poland and Hungary cannot say. You know, he does not have American troops stationed in Russia. They he has he is able he has a military that can defend its own country and its own interests. He is able to act as an important power on the global stage, which Poland and Hungary, when it comes to the global stage, you know, sign up dutifully for whatever America tells them to do, especially Poland. Poland will send its no matter how stupid of an intervention we have. Poland will send its troops there in the hopes that America will have troops in Poland when Russia invades Poland, which Russia will likely not invade Poland uh, at any point in time. I think actually seeing the Ukraine uh, situation as how unrealistic that is, but Poland is paranoid about this, about this possibility. That still doesn't mean we should necessarily hate on Poland or Hungary. It's still, it is nice that we're seeing, you know, examples within the Western sphere of governments that are able to resist some of the dictates of the globalist order. But when ultimately, when you're put in these stressful situations, they're going to stand with them because their their main concern is being invaded by Russia. Uh, particularly with Poland, Hungary, it's a little bit more different. I think Orban is standing so strongly with the West because he's worried that he would be color revolution if he did not stand with the West and that, you know, there's enough elements within his own society that doesn't like him having good relations with Russia that he could lose his election. He's in a very tough re-election campaign uh, this year. I think in April or May, he's uh, the elections are going to happen there. And the Western NGOs, all this, George Soros, all these people who are backing Ukraine are investing heavily in his opponent's campaign. Uh, you know, so, you know, he could very well lose. And that's why he's standing with the West. So maybe they'll back off and not call a revolution. And if he stood with Putin, uh, they would absolutely ensure that he l loses in, <laughs> in the spring and the upcoming spring election. With all that in mind, it is inspired. Well, I don't know if I want to use the word inspiring because it's being uh, filtered through the Marvel worldview of the West of Ukrainian resistance. But it is still like I don't want to necessarily condemn the ordinary Ukrainians who are picking up arms and fighting for the country. They're ultimately motivated by noble aims and noble reasons for fighting. They're fighting for their homeland. And, you know, if I was Ukrainian, I'd probably be on their side, but I'm not a Ukrainian. And that's not, at the same time, that doesn't mean we're necessarily pro-Russia, but we have to realize what Ukraine means in the greater sphere of the West and America. And it's ultimately a vehicle for allowing the global sphere to take over their country and to run it and use it as an experiment for mass immigration and their latest advances in LGBTQ plus rights. And that's not necessarily the average Ukrainian is not fighting for that. They're fighting for noble aims. But that's ultimately what's going to be accomplished by this. I don't know necessarily what the solution is for Ukrainians because Ukrainians seriously hate Russia. I'm not saying that they should necessarily join Russia. I'm even with this with Europe. Europe really has to figure out what they want to, how they want to interact with Russia, and really what this conflict is doing is it's now making more Amer or Europe more dependent on the gay than they were before. They're not creating an independent power block on their own. This is not even just Eastern Europe, but Europe. Uh, there are a few right wingers. Uh, you know, this person I won't name, but let's say that, you know, he's a prominent uh, Russophile back in the day, but now he's switched to being a Ukrainian supporter, even with a Ukrainian flag at his uh, Twitter username. <laughs> And he's claiming that this conflict will make NATO and the EU more identitarian and more willing to stand up for European civilization. And that's just a joke. What 
you know, they still dream of pan-Europeanism. Pan-Europeanism already exists. And you know what it is? It's gay pride marches from Lisbon to Kiev. That's what it is. That's not, that is the height of pan-Europeanism. People always want to think it's, you know, people, guys with imitating the 300 Spartans or something more inspiring. No, pan-Europeanism already exists. And they're going to bring it to Ukraine in, if, they, if they achieve victory and Ukraine in leaders. Not necessarily the people are eager for this. That's why they're signing up for the EU and NATO. And instead of you know trying to work out a peace deal with Russia, which is what really we want. I don't... I, the best option here is that Ukraine reaches a quick peace deal with Russia. But I see that opportunity slipping away due to their own propaganda and Western propaganda about how they're de easily defeating Russia. So they don't want to make a deal. I think Zel Zelensky may not even be in Kiev anymore. Uh, there is a possibility that is, I mean, he really is like if he got captured or somehow, you know, was incapacitated, you know, there would be no government in Ukraine. It'd be a failed state and keeping him alive and keeping him, as the leader of Ukraine is essential to the interests of the West and even probably even to Russia. I mean, Russia wants somebody to deal with to make a peace deal and who would replace the people who would replace Zelensky would be even less likely to make a deal. So that's why I don't know if he's necessarily in Kiev right now, but that's all a digression from the larger point of Ukraine is a gay client state. It's success and victory helps the gay we need to keep that in mind whenever we're getting psyoped into believing that this is a national struggle or this is somehow going to lead to an independent Europe that uh, is now strongly identitarian. That's all fantasy. Europe is now even more dependent on American military strength. They're all begging for American military strength. None of these people are going to seriously spend more on their defense, even though Germany is saying they're going to spend more on their defense. Uh they're not going to be a self-sufficient military. They're going to still depend on American military and still depend on America for its defense. And so is the rest of Europe. I mean, only really France seems eager to create something outside of NATO or independent. But I think this whole situation is changing that fact. And so it's really just making Europe more dependent on the gay, more globalist, and meaning making pan-Europeanism mean gay pride marches from Lisbon to Kiev rather than something based and inspiring. You can sympathize with Ukrainians and, you know, as I said, neutrality, true neutrality is the real point. Like, you don't even want weapons or whatever. The real thing is not you, uh, Ukraine victory, is that a serious peace deal where Ukraine and Russia can come to terms and, you know, Ukraine is no longer acting as some belligerent to Russia and they reach some deal. They, you know, everything is solved in that region. That's really what we support. And that's what really true neutrality. I mean, we're not 100% on Putin's side here or whatever. I do understand Putin's reasons for going in. I do not see Putin as the new Hitler or him as some madman who's out to genocide the Ukrainian people. He does have legitimate security concerns for going in. And they always like say this, like all these neocons and whatever are like saying, he, he invaded a sovereign nation. This is against international rules. And it's like, uh, look at, we invaded Iraq over made up national security concerns and nobody cared about that. And we, and also even the civilian strikes, they're like, they're killing many civilians. It's like, we kill civilians so much. We've killed like thousands of civilians in drone strikes. Even in Afghanistan, we did that. It's like, we claimed we killed like ISIS fighters when we just wiped out a whole Afghan family that was coming to Kabul airport to leave. And then like, and our only response is, whoops, sorry, ah, no big deal. While we're wanting to like execute Putin for like some mistakes that are for, for mistakes made by Ukrainians against their own people, but we've blamed them on Russians and that's what we want to do. A lot of what the uh, war crimes we've seen have been like uh, friendly fire on Ukrainians. Are Ukrainians just acting stupid? And uh, But we'll just blame it on Russian saboteurs. So in this fight, you should never be on the gay side as the gay is against us. It's our real enemy. China, or, or I'm not saying China, Russia is not a real enemy. We, Vladimir Putin poses no threat to us. If if you were a Eastern European who has bordered uh, Russia, 
Different story, but guess what? We're not Latvians or Ukrainians. We're Americans, and we want to put America first. And America first does not mean Ukraine first or caring about the the paranoia of polls. It's about worrying about our interests and our security concerns first. And right now, by siding with Ukraine, we're supporting the gay and their domination of the West. And that's what we need to be opposed to completely. Now, the second point I want to do is the Reddit world order that is a great part of the globalist American empire that is an essential part of the globalist American empire. And I think that for anyone who has been paying attention to the news is how easily psyop the <laughs> Western public has been by this conflict and how much soft power the globalist regime still has. Like a lot of people have been seeing this like, oh, Afghanistan shows that it's like falling. America is no longer a superpower. It's like, it's over, it's done. And now we've seen in this conflict that our tremendous amount of soft power, particularly through social media, you have to remember that social media was originally celebrated for how it spread American backed revolutions in the Middle East through the Arab Spring. And it's like, oh, it's gonna bring democracy and, and Americanism to every part of the world. China will fall, Iran will fall, all thanks to Twitter and social media. And then they changed their tune when we, when a few plucky activists were able to use it to help get Trump elected. Then it turned into social media as a, as a uh, cesspool of hate and disinformation, and we need to censor it. But now in the Ukraine, uh, the Ukraine conflict, it's returned back to its original uh, State Department packed roots, and it is now supporting whatever the State Department wants. And it is fully psyoping people into this. Somebody made the point about Twitter for Twitterfication of the conflict, which it's been much more increased. Even though the Arab Spring, people did not use Twitter as much in 2011 or even in 2013 and 2014. Like I was, I was working at the Daily Caller. You know, I just started the Daily Caller when Maidan first happened. The Maidan Revolution happened, and you know, Russia occupied Crimea. You did not see lawmakers just like spreading like the type of Marvel movie analysis of the people like serious policymakers like just making complete clowns of themselves on social media like they were not living on social media. Journalists were still there and doing important but it wasn't necessarily moving the discussion. It was much more of like this is how we're getting news and, and relaying it rather than like we're letting this influence us and dictate our entire worldview. And it's increasingly become much more clownish. Like there was a much more serious response than like this was not like people spreading Captain Ukraine memes of, of Zelensky and and like everyone thinking buying into these completely made up psyops that were going on. There was a lot more you really did think that I mean, even though we've learned that these weren't really adults in the room, but you really felt like there were adults in the room. Uh, today, you feel like it is just kids in a movie theater watching the latest Iron Man movie who are in control. Like there is no adults in the room whatsoever. Like we have a bunch of 14 year olds in charge who are completely serious and completely clownish and see the world through like insane resistance Twitter threads and Marvel movies. And that is what we're seeing now is that, you know, the Putin Hitler accusations are now being, I mean, just look at the Ukraine Twitter account. The Ukraine Twitter account should be embarrassing to any Ukrainian who has ever existed. Like this account has posted Putin as Hitler memes. It has begged for crypto donations. It has begged for all type. Of, it set up its own GoFundMe. It demanded that Russia get banned from Twitter. It's it's just falling like an SJW playbook through here. And you would have this would have been outrageous to see in 2014 for the Ukraine account to be like this, like to act like in a complete clownish way, and just like you know, it's it it, it just handed over like its account to the most insufferable 21 year old redditor and it's now that redditor is now dictating global policy and that's what the nature we're living in now and so the twitterfication of this is somebody made this point in a in a comment to a richard hanania post on the ukraine conflict and his predictions is that you really can't base past responses on any event for whether it's a war or pandemic based on what people responded in the past because we did not have our policymakers and our media 
all hooked on to Twitter and where they make decisions based on the hysteria and, and histrionic rhetoric that we get on Twitter. And they respond to that. And we saw this in COVID where people just went into complete panic mode and have decided that they're going to be masked at all times, double masked at all times, even if they're vaxxed and boosted. They're going to and they're going to enforce kids to do this. And just like the insane policy we've done over COVID was due to the Twitterfication of our society. And not everybody is on Twitter. You have to remember is that most normie people are on TikTok or Facebook or on Instagram. Like Twitter is not the normie platform of choice, but it's where the elites are. It is where the policymakers are. It is where journalists are. And those are the people who dictate how people think and how they view the world. And that's why Twitter is so important. And that's why they want to censor it and ensure that other voices aren't heard. And it is like showing that, you know, Twitter has done a number to ensure that the proper viewpoints is what the are the only viewpoints heard. I have talked with people saying like, you know, it seems like a lot of conservative users have, users have been banned because if you look at any prominent Republican politicians account, they're all the replies are angry libs like mocking them and attacking them. You rarely see like the boomer cons that I mentioned being like, this is awesome. And they've got like a poorly made gif, <laughs> of a of a red, white, and blue eagle. You know, you don't see that anymore. If you, and if you ever get retweeted by a major Republican politician, you're just gonna have like a ton of angry libs in the mentions. Like I've seen this when I've gotten retweeted by Wendy Rogers. Arizona State Senator, uh, big Nick Fuentes supporter, who's a uh, Trump endorsed big figure now. If you ever get retweeted by her, you will have hundreds of libs in your mentions for days. Like, and you know that does create this echo chamber of Twitter that this is what real people think about and this is how they view the world. And I've talked about how the the impact of social media on how the uh, the online right views the world and how it has a very it's very divorced from reality, but it also makes our policymakers and our journalists divorced from reality. And they are able to create this like uh, psychological torture chamber where people are molded into believing the most ridiculous things possible. And they're pushed into this due to the Twitterfication of our society. And so that is something, and Hanani admitted that he's like, he is like, I didn't understand that this would you know i was looking at this conflict from previous conflicts even more immediate conflicts of, such as what happened in 2014 after maidan and yeah we had social media then but it, i think you know trump and the 2016 election made it even more important uh for determining public policy and journalists you know dictating how ordinary people should view the world much more so than it was in early 2014 people were addicted to that time and tweeting a lot but uh, you know the nature of the world works like social media is even more important and this is another reminder why we have to do something about big tech censorship is that if we're completely excluded from the town square is that only the most insane people are going to determine public policy and we're seeing that now with russia is that people are just suggesting nuclear strikes against Russia and no fly zone, which would be a declaration of war. I mean, no fly zone against Russia. I was like, we would get a lot of Americans killed first off to establish that. And this is not Libya or Iraq. This is a, like a serious world power in Russia that has a serious air force. Like they're not just going to accept having a no fly zone, but we're just like, people are just suggest. And even like the war crimes, like people are just suggesting people do war crimes in Ukraine or people go up to a tank and throw a Molotov cocktail in it or throw water balloons into its turret and stuff. And like the most ridiculous guerrilla war strategies that you could ever imagine that's going to result in mass civilian casualties. But like it's 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 a cartoon world out there. And we're really seeing this in the Ukraine conflict. I think probably the most damaging thing to the American psyche has been Marvel movies, even more so than social media, because we it's not a joke. Like I have been making jokes all this time throughout on Twitter about like Captain America or uh, Iron Man showing up with a giant key laser to vaporize Russian tanks and just this expectation that a middle aged woman with no combat training and no real strength can just beat the shit out of like a dozen Russian soldiers through uh, sheer just Ukrainian power or something. 
All these things are believable to the mass population thanks to Marvel movies. And this even goes back to, you could even blame maybe like older action movies, but really it is Marvelization of the entire world. Even if you look at these uh, like the things that the Ukrainian defiance videos that they love. It really is like they're cheering on Deadpool. They love these guys using vulgarities like, you're so fucked. <laughs> you, you know, you're going to, you're going to die. It's gonna, they're like, this is so badass. The sunflower seeds. Oh my God. That old lady is so based. And even the, of course, the cringe Ukrainian account, of course, then posted this video. And this is once again, like so embarrassing for a nation. It's like our women are so badass. It says badass in the video. And it's like this angry Ukrainian lady. She looks old, but she's probably only 30 years old. And she's yelling at a Russian soldier who's probably only maybe like two years younger than her. And she's like, do babushka, bushka. And then she's saying that like, put seeds in your pocket so sunflowers can grow. And all these insane liberals now have, uh, alongside the Ukrainian flag, a sunflower emoji as well. A show about how much they love the Russians uh, killing these people. And they really are cheering this on like it's a Marvel movie or a, or a football game. It's like, yeah, get them. Like, boom. And, and Western propaganda is there with the Ghost of Kiev uh, thing, like saying like this Russian or this Ukrainian fighter pilot shot down six or so Russian fighter jets. Completely made up. And of course, you're, there's official blue check accounts that are associated with the Ukrainian government that are saying, uh, we don't have confirmation on this, but we're going to believe it anyway. And all these people will believe lies. Like there are several people who are saying you should stop doubting these stories because they're needed for morale boosters for the Ukrainian soldiers. There's some idiot at Barstool Sports, com the total, like the uh, ideal recipient for this propaganda who's saying you guys who are just idiots trying to shit on the ghost of Kiev are Kiev. Of course he would say Kiev. You know, the soldiers need that morale booster. It's just like they're in the game. Like, they need to know that they can still win when they're down 30 points. They need to know that. And they just believe this shit. So they'll just, like, spread lies. And they're like, you don't even need to know lies. Like, there's some another lie that's completely made up by an account. I don't even know if this is a parody account. But it's saying, like, this 17-year-old girl has killed 30 Russian soldiers. And... I'm not even sure if this is a parody account, but all liberals were believing this and like it doesn't matter if this is not true. And this this tweet has had thousands of likes and retweets and they're saying it doesn't matter if it's not true. We need to believe it for the morale booster, but they just want to believe these myths. And so they just live in cartoon world. And this is not just with liberals. It's like conservatives believe in cartoon world as well. It's like conservatives who are completely weak to do anything about the domestic situation, who surrender to Black Lives Matter, who allow Antifa to like take over entire cities and they have no ability to strike back at their domestic enemies, then get to pretend as tough guys by having the sunflower uh, meat emoji in their handle and a Ukrainian flag and they get to chest you know thump their chest and act like tough guys against Russia and it's the same with like we're pouring out all this vodka sorry Rusky Ruskies no more Russian vodka for us and these governors are doing this measure when they're completely powerless to resist anything that actually matters to an ordinary American lives you know, they're still going to be celebrating Juneteenth. They're going to still be having Ahmad Arbery Day. This is the most pathetic thing. It's like all these idiot conservatives like the Georgia Republican Party, you know, was completely powerless to do anything about having a day to honor a career criminal who <laughs> was and is has so many lies made up about him about being a jogger or whatever that he was just such a good boy who's turning his life around. They had, were completely powerless to stop an Ahmad Arbery Day from being made a permanent state holiday. Well, it's not necessarily a holiday, but a permanent state day of recognition. Completely powerless. But all these people want to be act like tough guys. Like, hey, Russians, you guys are fucked. Because guess what? I'm sharing this Ukrainian video and I'm no longer buying Russian vodka. <laughs> You're such pussies. And it's the same with these guys who are engaging in these guerrilla war fantasies about Red Dawn and how they get into Red Dawn. Like this guy I worked with, a daily caller, David Hookstead, who has zero combat experience, doesn't even work out, and just like watches sports, is talking about how Ukrainians need to like do, like have blood pouring through the streets. Like this 
that's what they need to do and how we can if america had this we'd have total red dawn on our hands and it's completely comic book world it's cartoon world that's what people live in and that's unfortunately what's driving policymakers to make their decisions is because they think they go on twitter and they see that their people are engaging in comic book world and they're like, okay, we're going to respond to comic world by world by having comic book world decisions. And they're leading to an unnecessary nuclear escalation because they think that Russia can be bullied around through Twitter ratios. And this is still a nuclear power. Like, you're not going to be like, oh, shit, we got ratioed. I guess we can't use our nukes. I guess we got to have to retreat. But this is how policy is made. And these are how Western lawmakers think that they can just tut tut and condemn and have a viral video and this means that they're easily defeating russia and the ukrainians are thinking this as well is that they're seeing like this psyops and propaganda and fake news stories spread about their victories and they may be surrounded by russian troops and then like we're kicking russian ass and they don't even know about real ukrainian casualties because the ukrainian government is hiding that from them so it is Reddit world order. I can't emphasize this enough. This is the Reddit world order we're living in, where too many people are just living in these informational cycles, and this impacts their own mindset for how they're going to do this. And this is like a remarkable uh, demonstration of, of gay soft power. Just overnight, they were able to convince millions of Westerners to adopt this marvelization of the Ukraine conflict and to care deeply about the Ukraine conflict to where they make their, you know, they adopt Ukrainian flags in their bios and they adopt the sunflower emoji. They were, this is an incredible feat of cultural power that they have. And the, inf the there's no one else who can compete against this. No one else. Like Russia is completely powerless against this. And it's also they're seeking to ban Russian media and to ensure that they have complete dominance over the narrative and a monopoly over what information people are hearing about the conflict. And this is something that we didn't even have in World War One. And like World War One, they always say that the reason why the Americans were more sympathetic to the Allies than to the, uh, the Germans was because they cut uh, German telegraphs to our lines to America. So the only news information we got were from the British and the French. We got no information from the from the Germans. And this is a very similar way that we're seeing this information war going on in Ukraine is that we're only getting this stuff from the Ukrainians and it's being filtered in through the marvelized worldview that uh, the masses have. And this is what they're believing. And so there's a couple take points, uh, takeaways from this. Like all these tough guy conservatives, populist types who've been talking about national divorce. Most of these people are going in and be like, we stand with Ukraine. Putin is a thug and a gangster. Oh no, we're so tough guys and, and wanting a new realignment, but we're somehow realigning ourselves with neocons and, and Reddit, but this is how tough we are. You know, all these people are saying this and they're also adopting like national divorce and civil war fantasies. It's like, that's never gonna happen. Like the fact that like the American, the, the deep state was able to convince millions of Americans to care deeply about Ukraine in a matter of hours Shows that they're never they're going to easily psyop America Americans into opposing a separation, even if that was possible. We saw this the same time with the George Floyd revolution. It's like they psyop millions of Americans into believing that there's a genocide being committed by police officers against blacks, and George Floyd was the most innocent human being to ever exist. He was a saint, and they all were convinced by this and psyoped into this into supporting riots and protests and destruction of American cities. They're and quickly able to do this, and they are and they know that they won't face any resistance. I mean, look at the situation that happened George Floyd Revolution. There was no resistance. Like, Trump couldn't do shit because the military told him, like, we're on the side of the protesters. That is the situation we have. Like, this is the comic book world we live in, and gay is able to, the gay is able to control it. I don't want to necessarily take for people to take that as a black belt. That's just a realism. And it's like I've been saying about how we need to stop with these fantasy delusions and look at things realistically. And instead, people are talking about how like awesome their Texas uh, secession state is going to be and how the rest of America can collapse and how right wingers can easily take on Antifa and BLM. And I'm like, uh, you know, it hasn't happened before. And look at how you're getting psyop by the Ukraine crisis. 
Like this, this is this is not a power that's about to separate or allow its separation to occur. Like, stop living in fantasy world. Stop offering fantasy solutions to real world problems. Stop living in the comic book world. Live in the real world because that is what the rest of the world is like is comic book world. We need to break free from that conditioning and look at things at how they really, really are rather than, you know, having our own alternative, alternative comic book world that exists where, you know, we're having this uh base national divorce and somehow in the national divorce the separated red state america would be much more of a threat to china it's like yeah. uh, there's so many i don't want to dwell on it i love talking about how stupid national divorce is but i only wanted to mention that but i need to emphasize about how powerful gay's response is i mean the fact that the simpsons released a uh a a depiction of all the simpsons characters waving a ukrainian flag with grim faces there was Saturday Night Live that began its show with a with a somber opening of a Ukrainian chorus singing a, a patriotic Euro, a Ukrainian anthem for this, and they're all dressed in traditional U Ukrainian garb, and there's like they have candles spelling Ki Kiev, not Kiev, and they even have a uh, sunflower references into this, and it's and they and the actresses who introduced the. The performance are doing it very somber and quiet and it's like you're supposed to be inspired and moved by this and this is what the globalist american empire is psyoping us into believe is that we want you know you're just some normie uh who doesn't follow politics at all and you turn on snl and you're just like wow this is so moving this is so powerful and you are led to into believing this that's always like the thing like you know people always think like political independence and centrist a really powerful group. No, this group is easily the most easily manipulated group in in America. And these people can be made to be led to believe anything and they just want to do whatever's right and socially acceptable. And if every, you know, if the Simpsons and SNL are telling them to believe something, they're going to believe it with full force and they're going to act like this is a powerful display to put a Ukrainian flag in their Facebook profile or whatever. Americans are more loyal to um, to the system than we probably led to believe. I mean, you're always thinking, like, I, I'm on Facebook and people are like, it's time to have civil war or civil separation. But when it really comes to the struggle, whenever push comes to shove, this is a big uh, uh, phrase that I think it's very important here. I mean, you saw this with populist thing, lining up, you know, ditching their uh, tough guy for non-interventionism and stuff and lining up in support of Ukraine and sharing Zelensky memes and trying to claim that there's a base reason to support Ukrainian nationalism or the Ukrainian side when, you know, you're on the same side as Reddit, uh, Joe Biden and Saturday Night Live, I want to say, uh, you know, I don't know if you're necessarily on the base side, I have to say that. I'm not, that's not necessarily saying a support for Putin, but... You know, <laughs> what happened to America first? But even, you could definitely see this with ordinary people. I mean, I guarantee you that there are tons of people who are talking about civil war and separation. It's like America is about to collapse and all these takes. And those people now have Ukrainian flags in their bios. I guarantee you there's a ton of people like that. If you ever want to look at how America is collapsing or its end is, is nigh, Look at this situation and see how much power it was able to wield in order to make the Europe do what it wants and to make even Africa and also, of course, Africa. All these African states came out of the United Nations and delivered the line that America wanted them to deliver. And they gave it in, in lines that would appeal to Westerners. So they were like, this is anti-colonialism. There was an African state, I forget which one it was, that gave this whole t uh, overwrought talk about colonialism when Russia uh, attacked Ukraine and this is all it is and that's now the message of this and even when you see like the uh, the tr intense influence of American culture on the rest of the world the way Ukrainian lawmakers not just the Twitter account but like all these lawmakers are responding to this conflict it's like they're uh, trying to pretend that they're Deadpool there's another example where the Ukrainian ambassador to the UN told 
Hit, uh, Putin to blow his brains out and or to imitate Hitler uh, in his bunker in 1945 and to kill uh, effectively telling him to kill himself and that these like they're asked like Ukrainian officials like what do you think about Lavrov saying is like fuck off Lavrov you know they're essentially adopting redditification of their own society and their own mores and so you want to say about Ukrainian nationalism when I'm seeing the results of it delivered by the West it's Looking a whole lot right, like Reddit, not this base version that a lot of some right wingers are seeing in, in themselves. And the rest of Europe is just doing what America wants. So the uh, the gay is not on the point of collapse. It still has an incredible amount of soft power. Its cultural influence reaches all parts of the globe, especially in Ukraine. And it is, and even when it's population among the American population, it still has a tremendous loyalty. Now, does this mean that it's gonna, it has the power to make Americans support war? No, because the Ukraine struggle, it is clicktivism. It is, it is showing support without any risk, and it's more about like, you know, it's the same way what they did with the Black Lives Matter support. It's like pretty much every normie apolitical white girl in america had a black square on her instagram profile after the black after the black lives matter riots pretty much everyone and all these people were like saying like oh you need to find a normie apolitical girl every normie apolitical girl even a lot of conservative girls had that and it's now in the same way we're seeing with ukraine is that they're doing support ukraine on their instagram profiles and this is just a pledge of loyalty to the system. But if it, the system actually required them to take a risk, say, with their lives or, you know, disruption, major disruptions to their lifestyle or the economy, even though there are going to be disruptions to the economy, but like major wartime disruptions, uh, you know, people aren't going to go that far. And you can already see that as like the majority of Americans oppose military action in Ukraine. Biden knows that it would be a disaster for many reasons, uh, but particularly for the 2022 campaign. This may be doing well for him in 2022. The difference is like Biden is totally missing. Like Biden only gave one public statement in a week, and I think that's it. That's all we're going to hear from Biden. Biden is not a leader in this situation. It does go to show like how he's not in control. It is this amorphous blob of the globalist American empire that has many different functioning aspects. It's not just directed by one person, and it's certainly not the president directing it, and they're in control of this, and they're using Zelensky as their figurehead rather than Biden. Biden's just kind of the old man taking a nap at the moment, not really dealing with the situation. And he's given no message to the American people, but I mean, that is one good news is that we're not gonna get involved in a war. So I do wanna conclude this uh, subject today. We're going we're gonna to have a great kind of elite question by just summarizing what it is about. Uh, you know, Ukrainian nationalism, I, I sympathize with what they're, with the ordinary Ukrainians who are fighting for. I'm reiterating this point, but ultimately what they're fighting for is entry into the globalist system and to be controlled by Western NGOs and the State Department, and that's going to lead to terrible consequences for Ukraine and more mass immigration and more LGBTQ plus uh, nonsense will be coming into their country to do this. That doesn't necessarily say that they should be dependent on Russia. I really feel that the solution is for Europe to figure this out, but Europe is not figuring this out. There's not an independent power block or a new Europa military arising. They're just all becoming more dependent on the gay in relation to this conflict. And, you know, the gay has tremendous soft power and cultural influence over the entire world. That's not dissipating. It's not in collapse. I think after Afghanistan, people were like, this is a weak superpower. It's on its way out. The Ukraine conflict has disabused us of those notions. And it is much stronger than I think a lot of its critics were led to believe. And I think we also need to emphasize what are the core ideological traits of the gay at this moment. And it is worship of magic Americans are in magic American culture. In fact, there was a great tweet I saw, which was really important. I should have said is like uh, the real sign of dissent or being a dissident is being indifference or hostility to black American culture is by account. This guy changes his name all the time, but it's like the best tweeter, I think is the name. I tweet him a lot. Uh, yeah, but it's on my timeline. And that is like 100% true. It's also with like dealing with also the LGBT stuff, but it, it's like, 
in the West, I mean, the rest of the West is like into it now, but those are the two main um, pillars of global American empires ideology is that is worship of magic is magic American culture and LGBTQ plus rights are agenda. And that's what they want to spread to the rest of the world. And it's already happening in Ukraine, even though many Ukrainians uh, do not want magic in their own country. And they certainly don't want migrants there. And they do think that they're fighting for, you know, their own national homeland to be free of of all foreign influences. But unfortunately, they're trading one foreign master for another and one that would ultimately be worse for them a long term, in my opinion. But I mean, maybe, you know, what would be best for them is for an independent in Europe to emerge that is not as poisonous and as hostile uh, to native customs and traditions as the global American empire is. But that option has not emerged yet. And, you know, there's not a third option for Ukraine. It's either on the side of uh, the gay or Russia, and they've sided with the global American empire. So that's the main thing we need to take away from this conflict. Now moving on to the Cognitive Elite question. As a reminder, you too can get the power to ask me questions or suggest guests and topics if you sign up for the Cognitive Elite option at Highly Respected's Substack. And that's at highlyrespected.substack.com. And also make sure to sign up for the IQ supplements while you're there as well. If you're not signed up already, you need that IQ boost for sure. And this question, I got a lot of couple, couple different questions on this for this week. This is a popular question. But I'll just pick up the one from Tom. He asked, Scott, what is your opinion of AFPAC? Or what was your opinion of AFPAC since it's now in the past? And that's a, that's a great question. The second biggest news story, surprisingly, I mean, it is a distant second uh, news story over Ukraine. It was heavily overshadowed by Ukraine. I think it would be the number one news story if Ukraine was not in the news was AFPAC. And of course, if you guys don't know, I spoke at the first AFPAC, but AFPAC is, I didn't go this year, been a little busy with a lot of work. And also, fortunately, not by not going, it allowed me to focus more on the uh, tremendous amount of psyops going over in the Ukrainian war and focus on what was going on in the situation there. Um, but yeah, so... I didn't get to go this year, but we'll go again in the future, I probably. And, you know, the event this year, of course, it's Nick Quintus's thing. It was, I've talked to a lot of people who went, and they said it was a huge event, had over a thousand people there. I think 1,200 was the number given, but people were very certain there was at least over a thousand. That's a lot. I think at our first one, we had a little, we had over a hundred, um, a little over a hundred. We had, I think, you know, 500 or 1,000 applications, but much more concerned about OPSEC at that time uh, than we are. Well, I think when you're running a big event, and I think Nick is just like, you know, you reach, he feels that he's reaching the mainstream, so you don't necessarily need to go through those concerns as much as before. Uh, then last year they had 500, and they had a sitting congressman speak with Paul Gosar, and then this year they had over 1,000, and, and they had two congressmen speak along with a lot of other serious politicians within the Republican Party. They had Paul Gosar speak again and MTG Marjorie Taylor Greene speak. They had a gubernatorial candidate from Idaho speak who's the lieutenant governor of Idaho. They had uh, Joe Arpaio, former Maricopa County Sheriff there, who's been a longtime conservative mainstay. They had Wendy Rogers speak, who's a prominent Arizona state senator. I talked about her a little bit before. <laughs> She's getting ratioed a lot for her uh, her her key takes on the uh, Ukraine and Russia conflict, which is unfortunate. Uh, but so this is like a big event, and the fact that Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's obviously one of the most well known Republican lawmakers speaking in this event, caused a whole news frenzy on this. But fortunately, Marjorie Taylor Greene is not. Uh, is not condemning AFPAC. She's defending her decision. Her speech was actually rather tame. Moderate people got, I think some people were even booing the speech because she's like, I reject all identity politics. It was like a very standard conservative speech. And then she made the same point about her, you know, she just gave her talk and she just talks to different groups of people. And this isn't a big deal. But of course, there's a, a tremendous amount of hysteria brewing over this. Uh, people are getting psyoped into giving a shit about this conference, or to not necessarily, but getting mad over this conference, over her speaking at this conference. And so people are getting whipped up into a hysteria about it. 
So it's getting a ton of attention, and that's pretty impressive considering we're in a war news cycle and an event, you know, just a political conference is able to get this much attention. Uh, speaks highly about the impact of AFPAC 3 on the news cycle and the amount of attention it's going to get. And the fact that, you know, this is like a, you know, a dissident right conference that's able to attract serious political figures. Uh, you know, that would have been thought impossible just a few years ago, or even the fact of getting over a thousand people that would have also been considered too fantastical and they're able to accomplish it. So it's, you know, really moving in the right direction. I think, you know, when you're looking at AFPAC, a lot of this uh, what I've discussed today has been somewhat blackpilling for people. I think, you know, the Ukraine conflict, if you're looking at it on Twitter and you're just seeing the responses from normies and they're believing out light lies and just putting, you know, the Ukraine conflict in a Marvel, their Marvel movie worldview. You're, you can see that there are other white pills out there, that there are a growing number of ordinary conservatives who are, object, who are accepting our worldview, that there are Republican politicians who are willing to speak with us and take our viewpoints and try to make them public policy. And, you know, it's not the situation is not completely hopeless. When we're looking at our political situation for today, you know, compared to when Maidan happened in 2014, you know, all that was there of the dissident right was just a few poorly read blogs that were getting like 8,000 unique views a month. That's like, it's like pathetic. And now we're at this point where, you know, we're able to have conferences that have 1,200 people and have serious lawmakers come and speak there and interact with dissident right people. And that is a huge accomplishment. And we're also seeing that people like Tucker Carlson and others are directing a political message that is very nationalistic and very America first. And that wasn't the case in 2014 where you had Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity as like the uh, people who set the conservative tone. Now different voices are setting a tone and they're much more interesting and much more America first. So I think it's like if you look at the domestic political situation, you know, the response of this, like, yeah, a lot of people are getting psyched into the Ukraine thing. And they're believing the propaganda. But at the same time, there are advances being made is that more people are waking up, more people are breaking out of the conditioning, and more people are looking for answers outside of the mainstream and what the two political parties are giving them and looking for alternative solutions and alternative ideas. And so that is a very white pilling experience. I, you know, you didn't see this eight years ago, but now you see it today. And, you know, you're going to see a lot more possibilities come up in the future. At the same time, you're going to see a lot more insanity in the future and a lot more of situations uh, that resemble the George Floyd revolution and Western media's response to the Ukraine war or just like Twitter Westerners uh, Reddit response to Ukraine. So. That's the one thing I want to keep in mind. So yeah, I think a uh, short story, I think half pack three was a, was a big success. I think it's going to be continue to be a success in the future. And I think it, it demonstrates, um, you know, the real popularity for America first nationalist dissident right ideas in the public, something that was unthinkable just, you know, a few years ago. And that's something to be white pilled about. So on that note, I'm going to conclude today's highly respected uh, make sure to like the and subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to subscribe to the IQ supplements at highlyrespected.substack.com. And until next time, stay respected.